Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. Welcome to the Horological Society of New York. Uh, my name is Nicholas Manousis. I'm the executive director, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here on a very rainy night. So thank you for everyone who made the trek out here in this uh, miserable weather. Uh, and tonight, you may you may notice that uh, it looks a little bit different in here. If you're joining us on, on Zoom, welcome. You may notice that the background is a bit different. We are in the General Society Assembly Room this evening, uh, and it's because the the main library, which is downstairs from here, is uh, undergoing a special renovation. Uh, so we're here just, just for this month as a, as a special, a different venue for our lecture. But I, I'm sure you all can agree this is a really nice alternative room, uh, the historic board meeting room uh, at the General Society. And we thank them for accommodating us in this room tonight. And as usual, let's get started with just a couple announcements. Let's see. Okay, so an education update. We have our New York uh, classes in the evenings and uh, uh, a few on the weekends throughout the month of October. And we are really back up and running with our traveling education classes. We've got a, a weekend of classes in Boston coming up hosted by the Escapement Club. And then we are traveling to Toronto, Canada uh, for a weekend there hosted by uh, our friends IWC and Mo Jabber. And then we're traveling to Los Angeles for a uh, one day event, November 19th, hosted by FP Jorn. So if you're here in the room with us, if you have any friends in these cities, let them know that we're coming their way. And if you're uh, joining us on Zoom, uh, if you're in any of these cities and you'd like to, to join us for a class, you're, you're very welcome to join us. And uh, looking forward to uh, all of those classes. Okay. And uh, today, this is a, an announcement I've been waiting a, a while to make. We have new membership benefits. And uh, for those of us that are here in person tonight, maybe you got a chance to take a look or try on some of the jackets that are outside. But I wanted to take a minute just to explain what this is all about. Over the past few years, membership at the Horological Society of New York has been uh, increasing by a huge amount. And so we wanted to do something special for our members. We wanted to give them new membership benefits, offer new membership benefits. And we thought a good way of making this happen would be to inter introduce new membership levels. So as of today, you can choose uh, if you'd like to be a bronze, silver, or gold level member here at the Horological Society. And there are new membership benefits that go along with each of those levels. Uh, at, the, uh, at the gold level membership, you get a very special members only jacket. Uh, you can see I'm, I'm wearing one tonight and this is a jacket made by our friends at the Armory, uh, the menswear experts. And uh, I think they've done an amazing job. Uh, there's also a tote bag that's, uh, that comes with the, the bronze level membership. I'm sorry, the, the uh, silver level membership. Uh, and there are, all, there are a few extra things that are thrown in there as well. Uh, the gold level members get priority access to our gala, which is uh, a good thing because the gala tends to sell out quickly these days. So we hope you get a chance to look at these, uh, these new membership benefits. We hope you get a chance to try on uh, the, the jackets out there. It's something that we're all really excited to, to launch. Uh, yeah, so that's our new membership benefits. In Yes, this is a great question. Uh, they are available uh, in women's versions, and all standard sizes are available, and uh, custom sizes are available as well if, if you need something custom. Uh, so the, the armory can, can take care of you. And it's, it's not just uh, New York. Uh, the armory has stores here in New York and in Hong Kong where you can go to try the jackets on and see the tote bags. But if you're not in New York or uh, in Hong Kong, uh, we can still help you out. We'll, we'll ship the jackets to you. So really exciting. Um, happy to announce this and uh, check it out on our website and on, on the Armory's website as well. All right. So on to the main event. That's something that I think we kind of all take for granted. Now, bear with me here for a second. When you, when you look at uh, a clock or you look at the watch on your wrist, uh, 
there are certain things that we just don't really worry about, you don't think about. Maybe if you have a moon phase indicator on your watch, most likely 99% chance, it's gonna be just above six o'clock on the dial, right? I think we all can agree on that. But why is it there? Why is it there? We just take it for granted. We don't think about it, right? But it's there for a reason. And tonight we're going to take a close look at that reason. We're gonna take a step back in time and we're going to look at the changing face of early modern time from 1550 to 1770. Our speaker for the evening is, uh, is uh, uh, an expert on the topic and she traveled here from uh, London to be with us tonight. Uh, and I'm, I'm very, very pleased to welcome uh, the keeper of the science collections at the Science Museum London. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Jane Desborough. Hello. Um, thank you for inviting me here this evening. It's truly a pleasure to be with you in person. Um, so as you know, I'm going to be speaking about um, my recent book, The Changing Face of Early Modern Time, 1550 to 1770. This was actually published in 2019, and we'd planned for me to come and speak to you about it um, in 2020. But of course, um, world events um, overtook us at that time. Um, so a big thank you to Nick for rescheduling so that I'm able to be here um, in person with you this evening. And also good evening to everyone joining on Zoom. Um, so some preliminaries um, before we get going into the details. Um, a bit about how the book came about. Um, well, it was based on the findings of my PhD research, um, but why did I choose this particular topic? Um, well, it was while I was doing some cataloguing work while I uh, worked at the British Museum back in 2010, uh, so many years ago now. Um, but I, as part of that cataloguing work, I was looking at lots of different examples of different dials, and this led to me asking questions about them. And um, the core one being, why were they so different before 1770? And what I mean by that is, why did those that indicated more than just the hour feature multiple functions? And then why did they essentially all look the same um, by about 1770? Um, frustratingly, at the time, I couldn't find satisfa satisfactory answers in the existing literature. Um, variation and change were all um, put down to um, aesthetics. Um, and... Um, but I knew there must be more to it. So I realized that this was an area that I really wanted to get my teeth into. Um, and as we can see with this example um, on the left there um, of a watch um, in the Met Collection um, by Thomas Alcock, um, dated around 1650, um, I wanted to know why the lunar phase um, was there, why the lunar date, uh, tidal indication and calendar date were present and not things like days of the week or position of the sun in the zodiac as in other examples, and we'll come back to this particular watch a bit later on. Um, so the central thesis in the book is that in the period 1550 to 1770, dials reflected changing ideas about the cosmos and its effects on life on Earth, of time, and methods of effective knowledge transmission. But by 1770, a standard format had emerged, um, as we can see in this example um, by John Arnold on the right here, uh, made around 1794. And there are a number of factors which led to this, as I will demonstrate. Um, in terms of scope, then, uh, you know what uh, my temporal parameters are. Um, why did I choose these? Um, well, the reason was so that I could begin with uh, the earliest examples, but crucially when watches coexisted with clocks, um, as this was a, an important um, part of the user story, um, thinking about uh, that concept of personal time and not just um, time on big turret clocks and things like that. Um, and also then ending in this um, era just before mass produced um, painted long case dials of the late 18th century before railway time. So long enough to chart change, but short enough to be academically manageable, if you like, and to provide, to provide a start on which future research can be based. Um, I haven't seen every kind of dial in existence, um, but I have based it on around 300 examples, which is as many as I could find, and particularly those that were not um, what you might call one-offs, um, and were of types made by different makers in different countries in this period, so not just English examples. Um, Kepler famously said that you shouldn't base uh, research on museum collections, 
Um, so I've been continually asked when I present on this topic um, if the dials I discussed were truly representative of what was being made at the time. And my response to that is always that collections um, such as uh, those at the Met or the British Museum, and also Science Museum, um, are a lot more comprehensive than, say, your sort of small town museum. Um, and they don't just contain what you might call fancy examples, um, because collectors at the time wanted to collect everything. So you do find there's a really wide uh, range of things in those collections. Um, and as a curator, I think we ne uh, need to research museum collections, otherwise what are they there for? Um, but also acknowledge their challenges. So in terms of my challenges, um, it was how do you go about identifying ways in which dials were used nearly half a millennium ago? Um, user testimony for this period is almost non-existent. Uh, we have things like Samuel Pepys's diary um, and a few references by Robert Boyle to watches, um, but very little else. And perhaps this was because it was too obvious a subject to write about. I mean, with a few exceptions, how many of us describe how we use our tablet or um, laptop today? Um, watch uh, workshop notebooks uh, for this period are also very rare, um, as Jeremy Evans tells us, even for um, Thomas Tompion, um, there are very few records, and I've also found this to be true. Um, gaps in the museum record also is a problem. Um, we often know when objects entered museum collections, often through 19th century collectors, and who made them from signatures on uh, movements, but we have very little evidence of who those original owners actually were. Um, so my response to this um, lack of direct evidence was to compare dials with texts from the period. So not just any text, but those with similar content and methods of um, knowledge transmission, um, which would have been used by the same um, owners of timepieces. And it was when I started to make these comparisons that I spotted patterns, knew that my hunch had been correct, that there was more going on here than purely crafting something beautiful, although most of the examples are very beautiful. Um, so I brought together evidence from the dials themselves and archival material in the form of rare books such as almanacs, um, we'll see examples of those soon, uh, mnemonic works, astronomical, temporal and horological treatises, uh, diaries, notebooks and even artworks um, to better understand dials in this period. And, um, and to avoid making assumptions about them based on the way we see the world today because it's very um, often easy to look at a dial and think that we know everything about it just because we're seeking something very beautiful and we don't really think about how users saw the world at the time so the effect of this approach is that there's no definitive proof as such i haven't yet found a diary entry um, where the writer wrote i use my watch to xyz um, but this isn't surprising of the period and can be equally said of other types of object. Um, people just didn't seem to record their actions in the same way that um, people did later on. Um, so what I've tried to do is ask new questions and base my answers on the wider context of which clocks and watches and their users and makers were a part. Um, so a few disclaimers. Um, I should point out at this point that I'm not a horologist by training. I'm very much a historian, so I'm hoping that my research can complement and build upon the wealth of existing scholarship on the mechanical and art historical aspects. Uh, throughout this talk, you'll hear me uh, say that aesthetics are not the main driver for change. And the reason for this is that I've taken a different approach and looked at different things. But that's not to say that I think that aesthetics are unimportant. It's just that we need to take in the bigger picture. Um, as others have noted, products made for wealthy individuals, such as clock and watch owners in this particular period, had to be of the finest quality to fit in with those opulent surroundings from which they are a part. Um, so sometimes the beauty of an object can be a distraction. So tonight I've divided my talk into three parts. Um, we'll first look at the influence of text on multifunction dials before around 1640. Then we'll move on to look at the influence of the decline of astrology and the mnemonic method. And then we'll look at the effects of users' emotions and makers' responses to them. The idea of this is that you get an indication of what the book covers. And I'll show you some nice examples of dials and texts as we go through. So the influence of text on multifunction dials before 1640. Um, when I say multifunction dial, what I mean is a dial that indicates more than just the hour and its subdivisions. So talking about lunar and calendrical information. The arrangement of that information, be it on a circular index 
or on a rotate or in a rotating aperture and the way ways in which that information was represented um, be it in numerical or pictorial form on multifunction dials in the period 1550 to around 1640 were drawn from the three interconnected traditions um, a belief in the efficacy of specific methods of knowledge communication uh, the mnemonic method of retaining that information and astrology, the belief that celestial cycles influence life on Earth. And although widely discarded later on, numerous layers of information, including multiple forms of lunar calendar, were significant to makers and users at this time. And how do we know this? Because of their similarities to, in terms of content to printed paper sources such as almanacs, as we shall see. So both users and makers would have owned timepieces, which included those works from which makers drew influence. We re must remember that high-end makers were not bad, badly educated or disconnected from polite society at this time. Um, to take up an apprenticeship to the kinds of uh, makers that they did required hefty fees. Um, and as Peter L informs us, um, English families, for example, often had um, what's known as a friend in London to make introductions for them with the aim of securing an apprenticeship um, to a younger for a younger relative um, on their behalf. So let's look at what effective knowledge communication meant in this period. So this, starting with the circular method, as in print, so on dials. Uh, the circular method of information arrangement was clearly integral to dials, but was not limited to them. It was an important element of what people believed to be an effective method of knowledge communication and a method of retaining information. There were th three significant reasons for this. First, to serve a religious and intellectual purpose by representing um, the divine hierarchy of heaven and earth using concent concentric rings. Um, the image that we can see in the middle there is Apianus's um, circular diagram for representing the planets and Earth in one concentric arrangement. And this was more than just simply a schematic view um, of the solar system um, at the time, since it was believed that by gaining greater knowledge, one became closer to God. And what better way to um, visualise greater knowledge than offering a visualisation of our place in the universe? Another reason was to serve a practical purpose. So by presenting a mirror image of the eye, um, even if that extended beyond uh, the three circles of our eye. Um, so this was in line with the view that the eye was mimetic and um, absorbed information more efficiently if that information was arranged in its own image, i.e. concentric rings, as in the um, diagrams that you can see here. And another reason was to facilitate the mnemonic method of knowledge acquisition, which at this time consisted of what they thought was three steps in the journey of the information being seen by the eye, um, being taken to the mind. And then the third step was it in the long term memory. And they believed that um, for it to move from the mind to the long term memory, you had to actively um, study an image to make sure that image was lodged in your memory otherwise you would just forget it so um examples such as lowell's diagram that you can see here on the uh, far right um are the kinds of things that you find in mnemonic works um because they were intended to help um with that process so um you'd use the letters on these different um rotating discs to assign information to and then test yourself as part of that active recall of knowledge and it was believed that that would help lodge it into your long-term memory what we have to remember is um at this time the printing press was only really getting going um and so not everyone could um, buy lots of copies of the works they were interested in sometimes they would consult someone else's library um, and then try and remember the information that they were reading also didn't have ac access to lots and lots of paper um, to make notes in the way that we can today um, so memory was a really important thing and as the um, printing press got going and um, books became more widespread and pamphlets and things like that um, we see the mnemonic method sort of dying away because people didn't need to um, do as much memorizing um, if you like um, Concentric rings um, conceivably serve the same purposes um, on dials. Um, this example of a table clock um, by Nicholas Vallin, um, dated around 1598 to 1603, has eight rings um, plus the lunar aspect diagram in the middle. 
um, physically, physically allowing for combinations of information um, was also important. Um, in all of these examples, information has been arranged over concentric rings, um, but each one uses a different method of indication. So with the clock dial, we have um, uh, the hand um, indicating on certain rings, we have rotating discs and apertures. Um, the diagram in the middle is obviously static. And then, as I mentioned, the lulls diagram on the right has rotating disks as part of that. But they're all combinations of information. Um, while both the number of functions on dials and the views of knowledge transfer I just mentioned um, declined by around 1640, the use of two concentric rings for arranging the hours and minutes survived on the standard format and beyond, as we know. So another method, tree diagrams, again, as in print, so on dials. So as we begin to speak about combinations of information, we need to acknowledge that there is probably a hierarchy in play, either from larger to smaller unit or from important to less important or unimportant information or from general to specific. And this was also true on dials and in text in this period. And hierarchies are created through the relative positioning and proportional size of numerals and text. And we can see this in each of these three examples. Uh, these methods of hierarchy um, creation provided sequential pathways for the eye to follow. Um, subsidiary dials um, as a method compare with tree diagrams. So in the example of this watch that we can see on the far left by Jean Vallier, dated around 1625 to 35, we can see um, four subsidiary dials and four apertures. And the visual weighting um, seems to favour uh, the lunar calendar in terms of its relative size and position on the dial. And in one sense, time is just another function in this combination. It's not necessarily the most important function. Um, physically allowing for combinations of information compared with tabulations of information. So in Flood's tree diagram that we can see in the centre there, um, dated to around 1617, we can see six layers of information and about 19 branches. Um, and in Hawkins' Almanac, dated around 1624, we can see six columns of information. And we also noticed that the dates of the month 1 to 31 are rendered using um, Roman numerals, um, including the uh, four, um, which is the same as um, the number four um, on dials. So that's quite an interesting uh, and dials also. Um, and again, while the number of functions declined and the prevailing views changed, um, the subsidiary survived to be an important part of the standard format dial. It was used for seconds, as we know, at around 1770. Um, in terms of information layering, stepping back then to look at the whole once more, intellectually, dials and texts provided layers of information, but whereas texts had relatively unlimited space to a point, um, dials had a very limited amount of space. Um, on multifunction dials of this period, there could be up to seven calendrical units acting as location coordinates for the user alongside detailed information in almanacs and mnemonic texts. Um, looking at these examples, we can see um, the civil calendar. Um, so the dial um, on the bottom left, which is by Jean-Baptiste Dubois, uh, date around 1645 to um, 55, shows the three units um, of the day of the week month of the year, date of the month. So that's three out of our seven. Um, the lunar calendar, all of the dials show the lunar phase and the lunar calendar one to 29 and a half. So that's another two, taking us to five out of our seven. And in terms of zodiac symbols, the two dials on the right, um, the top right, um, we're not sure who the maker is, but we know that it was made in Nuremberg. Um, around 1530 to 40, and the bottom right um, was made by Peter Grundle around 1576, show the positions of the sun and the moon in the zodiac. Uh, so that's another two units taking us up to seven. And sometimes um, there were dials that also included an indication of day and night and season of the year, but these um, seem to be a bit rarer. So whereas some authors have seen these dials as purely aesthetically pleasing and fashion items, in your, if you like, in the context of texts and similar information, such as almanacs and monarch treatises, um, which concentrated on not just 
um, predicting auspicious times to sow seeds and the like, um, but also the bigger picture containing um, concerning the interconnectedness of heaven and earth and coming closer to God by increasing um, one's knowledge. These dolls become part of a much more significant user story. And it seems to be no coincidence that they show these similarities and are not much more diverse in terms of representing um, more random information, because, I mean, you, you could uh, theoretically assign any information you wanted to these um, changing apertures and rotating disks, but they do follow these patterns and seem to um, represent the kinds of information that was useful to people at the time because it was being printed in all these different texts at the same time as well and seems to disappear around the same time. So there's definitely something going on and it's uh, not just random. Um, dials utilised specific communication methods and represented ideas that would have been familiar to users in the period, um, but they only featured for as long as they were actually useful um, to people at the time. So by the mid to late 17th century, things began to change, which is evident in both texts and dials. Um, perceptions of effective knowledge transmission, such as the mimetic eye, pathways and hierarchies in the way that we've seen um, would not necessarily have been recognized by a user in 1770. And yet some of those components such as the two concentric rings um, for hours and minutes and a subsidiary dial for seconds um, survived as part of that sort of long-term legacy of what by then were outdated methods. So now let's move on to our second section. Um, so looking at the influence of the decline of astrology and the mnemonic method. Um, for several reasons, certain dial attri attributes became less popular and eventually disappeared entirely, or survived only on rare examples. As we have seen, texts and diagrams provide a method for revealing these influences, and the de decline of astrology and the mnemonic method was, um, were major factors. So um, one thing we start to notice as we compare these dials and texts over time is that both become plainer, plainer almanacs and dials. As we've seen um, earlier, in the late 16th and early 17th century, dials were extremely varied. However, by the mid to late 17th century, both dials and almanacs became plainer and mnemonic diagrams began to disappear entirely, as I mentioned. Um, symbols and images also declined. Um, the number of indications themselves were reduced and the appearance of both almanacs and dials appeared more um, numerical, if you like, and perhaps you could describe them as a bit more like a date table as time wore on. If we compare these two watches, the first by Roberts, dated around 1600-1610, the second by, as we've seen, Thomas Alcock, dated around 1650, and the clock at the end by William Porthouse, dated around 1760-70, we can see that the number of functions increased. And if we then compare these with the three almanacs that we can see at the top there, um, one by Johnson, dated 1569, the next by Hawkins, dated 1624, and the last by Street, dated 1685, we can see that they too became plainer. So this change is not surprising when we consider that um, an aspect of astrology was the belief in similitude, that something on Earth behaved in a certain way because it reflected the appearance of something in the celestial realm. So for example, livestock were um, believed to be fertile during the full moon because their fullness reflected the state of the moon. And thus representations of symbols, imagery and hierarchies were a part of that. But representing similitude was no longer useful to people um, or useful to represent in uh, texts from the mid 17th century. And furthermore, the way in which astrology was communicated, like other practices, when it was in terms of the mnemonic method. Um, as I said earlier, people did need to remember things um, and uh, without being able to refer back to the original text in that earlier period. Um, and at that time, the appearance of a book's title page and similarly a dial um, taken as a whole and a month view in an almanac um, acted as a snapshot whereby readers and users could acquire meaning um, by looking at that snapshot before reading the details more closely. So if we compare the Roberts dial um, with Johnson's almanac, um, we can see the variety of information represented in such a snapshot and have the ability to delve deeper into the detail if we wish. Um, but the presentation of the all important combination is there. However, once the underlying um, purpose 
of presenting all of that information declined, there was no longer a need to provide the same overall snapshot. Uh, the combination had become less important. It was more the individual details and only some of those um, that survived. In the late 17th century, many dials retained multiple units of information, but fewer than in the previous era. And by the early 18th century, dials had significantly reduced the amount of information they displayed. And it was from then um, that there was often just one or two additional pieces in a, in a single layer, such as time and date. So less explicit prognostication. In the mid 17th century, when astrology began to decline, some almanacs continued to provide astrological markers, uh, such as symbols, but disconnected their advice uh, from those markers. And one important example uh, was the lunar information and in the calendar. Uh, the advice was similar, but no longer linked to the lunar phase explicitly. However, the provision of the same information on one page, lunar phase and advice, enabled readers um, who still subscribed to these ideas to continue to do so, and those that wanted to move on to do so also. So in this example from Gallen's Almanac, dated around 1642, we can see the occurrence of the full moon and new moon down to the nearest minute, and the weather predictions for each month on a separate but adjacent page. Um, some authors tried to rescue astrology as they described it and chose the perceived link between the moon and the weather to do so. But by the early 18th century, um, very few people still subscribe to this view. Also, it seems from um, what we see in almanacs. Um, clockmaker authors also began to distance themselves from astrology, um, specifically makers of astronomical clocks, as we'll see in the later section. Um, John Smith, for example, described the utility of clockwork in great detail, but did not mention astrology and yet referred to almanacs. Um, he would have been very aware of this tradition, um, but chose not to mention it and not to associate his craft with it, which I think is very significant. Um, astrology was no longer useful for people and makers provided what the user wanted. Um, so the divergence of the calendar, lunar and astronomical functions. When you consider their components in detail, it can be seen that the three functions of calendar, lunar and astronomical enjoyed a different lifespan and development, developmental journey. In this example that we saw earlier um, by Jean-Baptiste Dubon, um, the date was 1645 to 55, um, the three functions sit together and the combination is significant as we saw. Um, if we view dial change through the lens of the decline of astrology and the mnemonic method, then it's possible to identify the effect of the decline of astrology, as mentioned here, and then identify where specific components of functions continue to exist when they served other uses. So we can then identify what those other uses were and when they too declined, if they did. So let's look at calendar first. Um, with the calendar function, the number of calendrical units declined from the mid to late 17th century. As mentioned above, in the late 16th century and early 17th century, uh, there could be up to um, five uh, calendrical units represented. Um, if we count the rare, rarer examples that I mentioned where the season is indicated or the period of the day um, indications, and um, only those that were considered um, essential survived. Um, during the late 17th century, dials represented up to three calendrical units, day, date, and month. Um, the example that we can see on the left um, is in fact quite a bad example because it's uh, made a bit later. This is made by Mudge in 1764, um, and so it's a bit of a throwback really. But I wanted to show you it to show the kinds of information that were represented in that earlier period. Um, representation of three calendrical units survived the decline of astrology, as they were used for continued cross-referencing between calendars, um, also for equation of time reckoning, for religious observance, and planning if the user were a recipient of rents or taxes, um, because there were certain times in the year um, when taxes were collected and rents also, if you were a big sort of um, estate owner or landowner. Um, by the early to mid 18th century, it was mostly only the day of the month which survived, as with this example of a long case clock um, by William Porthouse on the right, dated around 1760 to 70, and which has a single aperture. It survived the decline of astrology, as it was useful for equation of time reckoning when compared with uh, tables, religious observance, and that financial planning. But 
that date indication did not survive to be part of the standard format by 1770. If we look at the lunar function then, um, there were three forms of indication which featured on dials in the late 16th century and early 17th century, um, as mentioned earlier. But the lunar aspect diagram was the first element to disappear during the mid 17th century. Um, the lunar phase and the lunar calendar, 1 to 29 and a half, continued to be represented throughout the period and survived the decline of astrology because they were useful for planning um, nighttime journeys under the light of the full moon, um, which has been well documented. Um, so, for example, this uh, long case uh, that we can see on the top left by Savage, um, dated 1775 to 85, and they were also useful for tidal reckoning, um, as with the Alcock watch. Um, and also we note in Culpepper's Almanac in 1650, there's a column there, um, date, uh, which is described as a uh, full sea at London Bridge. So indeed, the use of the lunar calendar in numerical form influenced print. Um, Almanacs began to reference the lunar calendar in this way, uh, using the one to 29 and a half, um, which seems to follow dials. So it's interesting that dials also influence text. And in this uh, example that we can see in the top right, which is uh, Zubler's description of astronomical instruments dated 1614 to 15, we can also see a, um, a tabulated, um, no, a concentric ring arrangement um, with lunar information in it um, and the outer ring um, showing 1 to 29. Um, so another example, perhaps, of dials influencing print, because we don't seem to see uh, these examples in print of, in terms of the lunar indications um, before dials represented them, if that makes sense. Um, however, lunar indications also did not form part of the standard format by 1770. Um, the exception to this was provincial long case clocks um, in areas where street lighting um, was non-existent at that time. Um, tidal reckoning, of course, continued to be important um, for the during the revival um, of um, and in the context, sorry, of public science demonstration, um, which is, um, itself declined in the mid 18th century, as I'll mention next. Um, so with the astronomical function, it experienced two lifespans or two different contexts of use and user. At first glance, these two timepieces might see, seem similar. Um, both have astronomical indications and have been batched together in some of the existing literature. I think they should be viewed independently. Um, so the first user context, um, as I mentioned earlier, the positions of the sun and the moon in the zodiac was represented on dials of the late 16th century but disappeared in the early 17th century um, before the decline of astrology in the mid to late 17th century. In this clock dial, um, which we saw earlier, a maker unknown but made in Nuremberg um, between 1530 and 40, we see a straightforward example of those indications. Um, they were useful for astrology, but seem to have been more useful in terms of the mnemonic method, given that they didn't disappear, um, didn't appear, sorry, as much in almanacs of the period as they did in mnemonic works. As part of the mnemonic method, then, um, changing cycles represented by imagery could be used to assign information that the user wanted to remember. Um, sight of a particular indication could then prompt the recall of that information practice of the mnemonic method was a continual search for images that you could use. Um, and this example on the top right um, by Ron Birch um, was a set of images that he was suggesting people could use if they found that useful. Um, and this even includes an image of a clock. Um, and cycles um, such as signs of the zodiac were recurring images in works like uh, Ron Birch's. Um, so useful for they for sort of triggering um, memory that he thought that you could um, use those to remember the information that you needed to. So, but this practice declined in the early 17th century before astrology, which could be a reason why zodiac imagery disappeared from dials at this time. Now, the second context of use. Um, refers to the um, late 17th century and early to mid 18th century. And these were um, the astronomical functions, um, which were often in more complex form than the uh, previous era, previous context of use. Um, and with these examples, it's important to view them in terms of the context of public science demonstration, which I alluded to earlier. 
And in this example on the bottom left by Samuel Watson, dated around 1695, we can see the time, calendrical information, it's got the positions of the planets um, and the lunar, in, the lunar calendar. And these indications could also be advanced or reversed um, to demonstrate um, combinations on past or future dates. Um, astronomy and mechanics, including clockwork, were extremely popular and astronomical, astronomical clocks such as Watson's were perfect for this kind of demonstration. Many such clocks were accompanied by sale adverts or pamphlets um, written by clockmakers who expressed the great utility of these clocks uh, for instruction. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they did not mention astrology, and this um, was very much outdated in their eyes by this point. Um, Watson himself wrote some instructions, um, which we can see here on the bottom right, uh, to accompany one of his other astronomical clocks, which is now part of the Royal Collection, um, which he called the Chronological Automaton, in which he did not mention astrology either, but also went into great detail about how useful his clock was for demonstration. Another clockmaker, Henry Jenkins, emphasised that there was nothing profane about his clocks, also distancing himself very much from the older traditions. Astronomical clocks uh, for demonstration also didn't survive to be part of the standard format by 1770. Most declined during the mid-18th century, when public science lecturing, in its 18th century form, um, had peaked and began to decline. So dials normally represented the kinds of information that users found most helpful. They were functional as well as pretty. It wasn't that attractive features such as planetary symbols were no longer thought of as such. It was more that the use for them had declined, as we can see um, from texts. The decline of astrology was not, uh, not only influenced dials, but enables us to identify continued and new uses of the surviving components of the functions. So up until this point, I've offered uh, something of a chronological view of dial development, but I'd like to use the last section to return to the point I made earlier about the voice of the maker and indeed their responses to users and how this influenced dial development. So let's look at the effects of users' emotions and makers' responses to them. So there are several examples of users' emotions and makers' responses to them influencing dials. And by emotions, um, what I mean is trust and distrust and aversion to an embracing of change, all of which come down to user ease and comfort levels. Um, evidence of maker responses is not surprising given they were skilled in marketing um, and developing relationships with customers. So let's consider three examples of that. So firstly, alternative hour schemes. Dials with uh, these alternative hour schemes represented um, over concentric rings have been well documented. In this example of a clock, again, um, we're not sure who the maker is, but um, it's been dated to around 1575 to 85. We can see four different schemes. So working from the outside in, um, we've got Roman numerals 1 to 12, um, which seem to be common on English and some German clocks. Um, on the latter, um, that was often combined with the second ring of Arabic numerals 13 to 24. Um, on the next ring in, ring in, we see two sets of Roman numerals 1 to 12. This seems to be common on clocks from different countries. On the third ring, we've got Arabic numerals 1 to 24, which seem to be common on German clocks at this time. And then on the innermost ring, we have four sets of Roman numerals 1 to 6 which seem to be common on Italian clocks. Um, they seem, these clocks are different, um, our schemes represented on them, seem to be popular in the late 16th century and early 17th century, with some much later examples also, but generally they declined during the early 17th century. This seems to be mirrored in almanacs, where um, astrological advice was given to the nearest hour and reflect the numeral types um, that were used in that particular place. Um, given who the wealthy users were of these, uh, clocks. Uh, they were conceivably a handy tool for cross-referencing between our schemes, um, possibly while travelling or corresponding with contacts overseas. Uh, this was one of the first steps towards uniformity. A convention of around the early 17th century was that dials from different countries all seemed to start representing the hours as 1 to 12. Another example, um, experiments with minute indication. <laughs> 
So some users readily accepted the introduction of minutes from 1657, 1675, and some didn't. As we know, eventually everyone had to accept it. Um, looking at written evidence then, um, we'd see that Robert Boyle referred to his minute watch when conducting experiments which indicates the importance of the mechanical timepiece and thus their makers uh, to nascent science. Um, Samuel Hartlib um, in his writings um, starts off by referring to quarters and then moves on to talking about minutes. So that's quite an interesting acceptance. And um, pamphlets with instructions on how to manage the new timepieces, such as um, one by Thomas Tompion, um, indicate the need for reassurance for some users. So going over how you, um, to not um, destroy or um, damage your watch by trying to um, progress the minute hand. Um, dials of the late 17th century with both quarters and minutes indicate experimentation with the new display and a temporary facility for the relu reluctant user. So the clock that you can see on the right is an early pendulum clock by Solomon Costa, dated um, 1657 to 59. And um, we can see the um, on the outer ring, there's um, capability um, to represent the minutes and the uh, quarter hours as the minute hand goes round. Um, initial representation of minutes took different forms, as you can see by the uh, watch by Thomas Tompion on the left. Uh, this is dated 1675 to 79. This seems to truly celebrate the minutes by giving them the whole sort of outer perimeter of the dial. Uh, the upper subsidiary dial shows the hours in cycles of six hours and the hand indicating in an anti-clockwise direction. And then the lower subsidiary dial shows the seconds. So one is left to imagine what might have been, but the two concentric rings that were part of the standard format and that we recognize today prevailed. Um, it was very similar, of course, to the early representation of, uh, representation of the quarters concentric to the hours. Um, so any aims at departure did not catch on. And I seem to recall that um, another writer, um, possibly Alexander Cumming, um, suggested that um, dials also represent thirds. Um, but as we know, that didn't catch on earlier, but it's interesting that people at the time seem to um, discuss what might have been or what could be produced. So it doesn't seem to be that um, a decision was made as soon as the capability for minutes was uh, realized mechanically. Um, but by the late 17th century, then steps had clearly been made towards the standard format, what was gonna have to be accepted. Um, so then a third example is equation of time. Uh, the increased understanding of the equation of time in the late 17th century led to publications um, of pamphlets on it, uh, its inclusion in almanacs, and in turn instructions written by clockmakers to reassure their users who at first didn't understand it. Um, so the, um, the example that you can see on the top left is by John Smith entitled Horological Disquis Disquisitions, um, they did 1708, and the uh, watch paper on the right, you can see there also has the creation of time data on it. Um, Jenkins helped users avoid damaging their watches by constantly adjusting them to agree with the sundial. Um, so he'd clearly been approached by his customers um, that had concerns about that and was um, writing a response to those. Um, instructions written by makers again offered reassurance and helped maintain trust in makers um, and their work. As we know, some timepieces were made that indicated the equation of time, such as uh, this lovely example by Berthold that's um, dated 1752 and in the Metz collection, that we can see on the bottom left there. Um, but it's well documented that they would have been very, very expensive and also, surpri not surprisingly, uh, did not form part of the standard format by 1770. Um, it was noted earlier that the singular um, calendar indication of the day of the month um, for equation of time comparison with data tables was one reason it survived as long as it did. And this was obviously a cheaper option. So um, one example of this is the dial that we can see on the bottom right there. Um, this example made by Rosé, dated around 1780 to 1810, um, but it did require the user to have a timepiece and equation tables for cross-referencing, which it seems that most users did. Um, by the mid to late 18th century timepieces had become accurate enough to not need to be constantly compared with sun dials. And sure enough, we see a decline in the latter. So the de devices of both uh, the user and the maker 
influence the desires of both the user and maker influence the appearance of dials in this period. Um, this is essentially an issue of trust generation and maintenance. Uh, so some final thoughts then. There's much more to say, I think, and more research is needed, but I hope this book um, will inspire others to ask questions of dials. Um, what have we seen today and why is it important? Um, well, clock and watch makers of the past were embedded within this world of experiment, knowledge formation and exchange, which characterized the early modern period. And I think that's very evident from their dials. Um, they're highly literate, highly skilled and an integral part of this wide ranging and highly connected networks. Um, early modern clock and watch makers played an active role in disseminating, validating and discrediting um, ideas and practices. Um, and as particular ideas and associated practices prospered and declined, the effect was mirrored not only in texts and diagrams, but also on dials. And the standard format by 1770 was as much a product of what makers chose not to include as what they did. So hopefully I've shown that we can ask new questions of objects even when supporting um, archival evidence is frustratingly rare. Um, this is just one method for doing so, but there of course will be others. Um, so thank you very much for listening and um, we'll take some questions shortly. Uh, let me switch positions with you here for one second and we'll turn off the screen share, which I was reminding myself not to forget. All right. Uh, so now it's time for some Q&A. Uh, I'm, I have lots of questions, uh, but I'm sure the audience does as well. We don't have a wireless microphone tonight, so I'd ask you to try to speak loudly, then uh, favor, uh, if, if you mm -hmm. please repeat, repeat the questions into the microphone so our friends on Zoom can, can hear. Um, so let's take it away okay. with, uh, with the Q&A. Uh, if I may, I've got one, uh, okay. yeah. a question for you. To Try and stand here. Um, where, where is your book available? Tell us more about your book. Oh, yes. So um, it's available online. Um, the publisher is Palgrave. Um, so, yeah. So if you uh, have a look on their website, and I think you can find it on Amazon as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, did, you, did you have a question? I think you're. Uh, yeah. I'm just curious how you developed an interest in this experiment study. Okay, so just to um, repeat the question for our attendees on Zoom, and the question was how I developed an interest in this particular area. Is that, yeah. Um, yeah, so it was very much when I was doing um, cataloguing work um, at the museum many years ago. And part of that cataloguing work was looking at lots of different dials and having to enter into the database what was indicated on them and who their makers were and that sort of thing and it just struck me that um, we didn't know who their original users were and then I wondered at the time why they indicated the sorts of information that they did and um, then tried to find those answers in the existing literature in the libraries um, certainly in London and um, just didn't seem to get the answers and there was uh, the um, histories all seemed to you know focus very much on the technical development side which is of course very important um, but then just grouped all this um, information about the indications into another section called aesthetics or something like that or fashion items so that was why I got interested in the first place but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know who was next uh, is it I think you were next yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much I really enjoyed how you the text layouts to how the dials look. I thought that was really interesting. And for mind me, we have some 17th century books upstairs that I'm sure you would be interested right. in. Um, uh, but I guess my question is, did you find evidence on the maker side of them saying things like, oh, well, you know, I don't really think this is a very useful indicator, but this is what my customers want, or like this was really a pain to produce or anything like that? Or was they very really more focused on what the users were doing? Thank you. That's a great question. So just I'll oh, nutshell it for our um, Zoom attendees. So the question was about um, whether there was any evidence from the uh, maker's side about um, how uh, what was featured on dials and um, yeah, what's coming from their customers and that sort of thing. Um, so I did try and find that information. It would have been wonderful if um, I'd been able to get that perspective. Um, I think there were the main challenges to that were lack of surviving 
um, documents from the makers workshops themselves um, for this particular period there just seems to be nothing surviving um, apart from a few scraps about um, you know more of the technical side of things number of wheels and gears and that sort of thing um, and as I mentioned even um, Thomas Tompion's um, records are frustratingly um, sparse um, so yeah I did look for it um, what I've been able to gauge was um, what may, uh, users seem to have asked of those makers. So um, in what they were writing when um, they seem to be, the tone to me seemed like sometimes the makers are quite frustrated, like certainly with the equation of time element and um, users possibly damaging these great pieces that makers had made for them and then possibly bringing them back to the workshop and saying, oh, well, damage it because I was trying to make it agree to the sundial and then they're saying, can you stop doing that, please? That kind of thing. So that's all I was able to find really. Hope that answers the question. Um, it was oh. on, on that point real quick, I, I do have a question, but I think your research was probably stymied a great deal by watchmakers being famously reluctant to share their secrets <laughs> with other watchmakers. That was part of their stopping trades. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to write too much about what they did. Anyway, that was and my question was about the uh, example of the clock that you used uh, in uh, various uh, representations of the hours, which had the four rings. It looked like it had four hands, but maybe they were two hands that were two sided each. Do you know how it actually worked? What um, so the question there of uh, Zoom people was um, the slide on the different, um, the alternative hour schemes with the four um, indices for the different hour schemes, um, how were they indicated upon? And yes, I, I'd have to bring it up again, but I think there were um, the two different hands and then uh, the discs rotate as well and that there's a static marker. So two of the discs rotate and that's how they achieve that um, mechanically. Um, yeah, That's a rather basic question. Um, almost all of them, I think, or all of them were based on 24 hour a day, whether it was 12 or 6 or which were multiple. When did you see the, that can be settled on a 24 hour motion of passage of time? Um, so yeah, so for Zoom, sorry, I'm trying to keep up with the, <laughs> the descriptions and sorry if I don't paraphrase this in the right way. But um, so the question was about um, that the different hour schemes were based on the 24 hour time scheme and was it about when they focused on 1 to 12 on the dial? Was that they... so much, well, 1 to 12 being half of 24, mm. the, the base is 24 in mm. case, so when was the 24 start? I think from the very first um, clock and watch dials, I mean, I haven't seen, um, they always seem to be based on that. And so, yeah, even with the one to six, the, um, yeah, seven is represented by the one um, numeral as you go around. So it's always based on this 24 hour um, scheme, um, certainly for the clock and watch dials I've seen anyway. Is there another? Oh, yeah, go for it. <laughs> Did you come to any conclusions on uh, the emphasis of different functions in terms of their style, their placement on the dial, um, in terms of their priority? For example, you could look at a dial seeking time or lunar phase or day of the month. And so did, the, did you see patterns develop over time or placement to emphasize one or another? Uh, today you can see anything emphasized yeah. or almost all of them equally emphasized. So I'm just curious if you saw anything during that period. It's a really good question. So I'll try and paraphrase this correctly, but do tell me if I haven't. Um, so um, for people on Zoom, the question was about um, uh, the emphasis on um, the different functions and if there were patterns over time in terms of their placing on the dial and those functions. Um, <laughs> Yeah, very good question. I did a lot of work at the beginning of my PhD trying to um, measure the size of each, each uh, subsidiary dial and also the numerals as well and to try and analyse that data and see if there were um, any patterns emerging. And um, there didn't seem to be, whoops, I pressed something on, sorry. Um, but what I did notice was with the earlier dials, um, the um, when there were subsidiary dials um, on one face, um, the subsidiary for the hours didn't seem to be the most prominent. It was always slightly smaller than some of the others. And I just wondered if this was emphasizing that thing about 
you know, the set of indications being the most important thing and not just the hours and the time. As I guess we come to look at these hours and we think, well, of course, time was more important because it's more important to us. But um, I don't think that was necessarily the case for them at the time when I, I guess um, they didn't need to be at a certain place at a certain time in this way that we do when we go to work today and need to catch a train and things like that. Um, does that answer? Uh, thank you. So, ooh, yeah. I'm not sure if I'm going to phrase this correctly, but uh, did you consider when you were going through the different dials and you looked and compared them to um, the astronomical or, or the almanacs and like the way things are laid out, did you consider other things that might have come into play as well? Um, you made a, a brief mention on it at the end that as uh, you got into later clocks, there were they became more um, accurate, and did you did you find or see that that how accurate these clocks started to become meant that maybe they focused on the time more so than trying to provide a number of other things that might be of importance to people that, that for the earlier. Thank you for your question. Again, I'll try and summarize and please do correct me if I get this wrong. Um, so the question was about. Um, whether um, accuracy um, became more important um, for the dials and whether there were other factors at play making the other functions sort of less important over time. Was that the right sort of question? I think that is um, very much the case and it does seem to be um, in terms of um, comparing um, these almanacs um, with dials because they contain the same information. That's why um, those texts are not others. It does seem that once astrology did sort of uh, diet's final death in terms of being represented in almanac saying right you need to um sow the seeds at this time of year and when the moon's you know in this um position and at this particular time once that faded away then what was left was the time and as we know from sort of wider history um time did become more important to people um industrialization is a bit later than my period or just after but um yeah i think that's why dials did become plainer really because yeah, it wasn't so important to people to represent these other things. Um, but then we also know that there are those one-off examples later. Um, but then I think that's part of a different story. Does that answer your question? Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, and, yep. so I was I was noticing that probably the majority of your examples were from British makers. Do your findings apply to makers from other countries? Um, so, yeah, the question was about um, the examples that I showed in the presentation. Um, were they um, mostly um, from um, English makers? Or, and do the um, findings also apply to other um, what clocks and watches made in other countries? And yes, they do. Um, yeah, um, there is a parallel there. So some of the examples that I showed were made in um, France um, and Germany as well. And it seems to be. Um, certainly in that area in Europe, that um, the uh, changes um, yeah, happen in all the countries around a similar time. And also I looked at, um, I wasn't able to show any today, but some almanacs um, in German and French, and they seem to follow the same patterns as the English almanacs. So that's quite interesting as well. Mm. So, yeah. This is not a particularly well-formed question, <laughs> um, but when I hear you asking about the British clockmakers versus those from other European countries, it makes me wonder about timekeeping from other parts of the world where mm -hmm. systems may in fact be quite different mm -hmm. time pieces are different. And I know that's beyond the scope of what you did. I just wondered if you had any interesting observations about that. Oh, great. That's another great question. Thank you. So, um, yeah, people on Zoom, the question was about, um, yeah, what I've been speaking about um, is in relation to um, the European countries and timekeeping, but what about um, in the wider world? And I think that's a really good question. It's something that I haven't yet had chance to explore, but um, yeah, some of my colleagues are very interested in um, timekeeping in China and Japan um, and also um, other countries like Mexico. Um, so it would be really interesting to um, yeah compare those different early timekeepers and uh, see what we can find. That'd be a great study. I'd love to do something like that. Oh, <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> Great. Um, is there Any anything questions? else? Uh, let, let's give Dr. Desborough a minute. <laughs>
Okay, so thank you for everyone who came out tonight on this rainy New York night. I appreciate it very much. Uh, and thank you again to, uh, to Dr. Desborough for traveling all the way uh, from London to be here with us today. Uh, thank you for everyone on Zoom who joined us tonight. And we'll see you next month. Uh, we'll see you uh, at our November lecture. Have a great night, everyone.